Hello everyone. Uh, welcome to another edition of Ecofree's uh, Global Summit. Today uh, we are having a panel discussion on our international organizations in shaping peace. So uh, the panel is led by Greshma. Uh, Greshma is the uh, Ecopis uh, Team Cafe found, and she is also an alumni of UPS. So I welcome Greshma uh, to lead the panel and also to introduce the panelists to the viewers. Thank you. Thanks, Arya. Thanks for the introduction. And I'm so happy to be here and um, welcome all of you to this uh, panel discussion on the role of international organization in shaping peace. So we all know that international organizations are playing a great role in peacekeeping, mediation, and post-conflict resolution. So let's uh, hear from the change makers today. So our panel is um, you uh, let me introduce our panelist, Dr. Abraham Karikim. He's a great visionary and former principal of Matoma College, Sirivella, Kerala and where he worked for 28 years in the Department of English. He holds PhD in English and Interreligious Studies. Dr. Abraham is a graduate of Bose Equipinical Institute and has attended several summer institutes in Eastern Mennonite University, United States. He is the coordinator for the URI South India Sri Lanka region and secretary general for the URI Asia region. Dr. Abraham has authored 15 books and edited several books and journals. His important works are the concept of salvation in Upanishads, the Bible, and the Quran, and the interfaith novel, Super Souls Revisited. He also organizes international conferences on Holy Book at regular intervals in different parts of the world. He represented Marthoma Church and Yara in general assemblies of the World Council of Churches, he has been a fellow traveler of Thai's community from his student days. He has been engaged in interfaith dialogue for more than 30 years. He is the founder of Global Campaign, One Billion Youth for Peace. The Global Campaign, One Billion Youth for Peace is to enroll one billion youth as peace ambassadors in the course of one year, course of 10 years. And uh, I will thank you. Thank you for joining, sir. And I also like to introduce Maria Crespo. She is very active in the Roman Catholic Church in Argentina. She has been involved in many interfaith activities, and she she also teaches at the uh, Catholic seminaries in Buenos Aires on ecumenism and interfaith dialogue. And she is the director of member support at the United Religions Initiative, an organization that fosters interfaith cooperation to prevent religiously motivated violence and create culture of peace, justice, and reconciliation. The organization brings together in a network more than 1,000 interreligious groups in more than 100 countries around the world called Circles of Cooperation. Maria has been involved in initiatives since 1997 and is a first staff and global director outside the United States. Welcome, Maria, and thank you so much for joining us today. And we are really looking forward to hear from you. Honored to be with you all. Thank you. And Sylvia, Sylvia Murray is the facilitator of Advocate for and Believer in Peace Leadership. She's a co founder and board member of SARA a peace-building non-profit that equips and accompanies the next generation of peace leaders in Asia. Her work is centered on community-led peace-building, conflict transformation, and peace education, and has experience in philanthropy, community reconciliation, compassionate communication, and organization, organizational capacity building. She holds an MA in coexistence and conflict and an MBA in social impact. Sylvia currently serves as the head of program and strategy at Euphrates Institute, an organization that equips, connects, and uplifts peace building worldwide. Welcome, Sylvia. 
to this uh, panel. And I would like to welcome Father Prasa Thirur. He is the Secretary of KCBC Interfaith Dialogue and Ecumenism. And he is also the Rector and Superior at the Aliva uh, Philosophical College. And we welcome Father Prasa to this panel discussion. Thank you, Father. And so let's begin our discussion. So uh, we are really looking forward to hear from you and especially on peace building. So um, I'm thinking what peace building really means to you and why it is so important at the current era. So this is a general question. Um, you can answer it. Maybe we can start with Dr. Abraham. Uh, sorry, you are muted. Okay. Um, good morning. Good afternoon. Thank you, Kreshma. From the beginning of February, we have been sitting in marathon sessions because of Interfaith Harmony Week worldwide. So happy to meet all of you again. And I'm so happy to learn a co-piece, Teen Cafe. He is making a difference in the world already. It's making a um, mark among peace building pioneers in the world. So we have great faith in youth. So thank you for all your efforts. So the question posed here is, uh, what is peace? And why is peace building important in the world today? If you ask me personally, I will say peace is sanity or restoration of sanity or restoring the, the cosmic balance. We have lost the cosmic design somewhere, somewhere in the journey of the planet Earth. So uh, we have deviated from the design uh, of the creator. So that is a grave danger. So that is why the peace is lost in the world. Because in God's world, in the creator's domain, there cannot be insanity, there cannot be destruction, there cannot be death and all these kinds of problems. So it is not made by God or the creator, but made by human beings. Why? Because we deviated from the actual terrain where we ought to be. So we have to come back to that realm of sanity that is peace. So I would like to quote a Sanskrit sloga, a quotation from Sanskrit, Lakshmir Lakshanahine, Kulahine Saraswati, Apatre Lepate Nari, Mecha Varshandu Parvade. Three things are like rain falling on the mountains. What is the use of rain falling on Mount Everest? No use. See, three things are like that. One is Lakshmir Lakshanahine. Lakshmi and all kinds of wealth and prosperity and goodness given to undeserving persons. This is exactly what is happening in our world. It is like rain falling on the mountains. Mecha varshandu parvade. Mecham rain falling on the mountains. The second thing is Kulahine Saraswati, education given also to undignified people. See, we find all the best brains of the world employed in making bones. So that is also uh, not originally planned. The best brains are employed by Pentagon and also the, the bomb makers. So Kulahine Saraswati, Saraswati or education is not supposed to be given to undignified or unqualified people. And the third one is just a family. Apatre Lepate Nari. 
if a, what is the use of uh, a beautiful or a very very uh, intelligent wife uh, given to an undeserving husband and the vice versa you know these three things are like rain falling on the mountains so that is the problem with our universe we have deviated from the original path so then uh, that is the definition okay restoring peace that is the definition for peace which i would like to uh, make then uh, why is peace building important because uh, we we should have we should leave a world for our children and our grandchildren to live in peace because the world is not for elders tomorrow there should be a world but we are not sure whether there will be a world to, tomorrow because there is there are rumors of war everywhere sounding of the trumpets of war everywhere in ukraine and russia if this develops into a great war what will happen that will see a third world war see we cannot leave our world to be like that then what will be the fate of our children grandchildren so that is where peace building gains its importance so we have to unite with all the peace building networks organizations in the world to keep the sanity of humanity and also the sanity of or the the soundness of our mother earth to give a beautiful world for our children and grandchildren thank you thank you sir thank you we have to live a world of peace for the children and grandchildren from that point i would like to uh, welcome maria for sharing the system thank you and again i i applaud um ekpis uh think of the effort uh which is amazing and uh, if someone who knows me knows that i care enormously for kids and youth so it is an honor to be among you and uh, accompany your work which is again uh, all all the group all the things that you are doing are so amazing um it is very broad to talk about peace but i want to focus at this moment uh in the fact that peace is might be referred to the inner peace uh the peace that we all carry in our hearts and how to be uh the environment the environment in which we move if it, it is in peace in both situations i think that we may think that peace comes from outside so we want to have a peaceful family and a peaceful city ah, a peaceful work to be in peace the truth to be said even if the family is in peace and the city is in peace and my work um colleagues are in peace if i don't if i'm not in peace in myself if i'm not sure of what i'm doing if i'm not connected with my spiritual and my wishes and uh i won't be in peace even if everything is very calm on the outside if i'm peaceful i may be going through difficult situations at work at home uh as ibrahim saying in the country or the the, the world uh but i can be in peace and this be this piece that i'm talking is it's not kind of superficial i'm in peace mm, i'm calm and everything is falling down and i'm calm is i'm ready to do what is needed i'm grounded on my spiritual path and i'm grounded in what my talents are and i come here to serve and that gives me peace but because even if it is a very small thing Uh, a drop of water in the ocean as mother theresa would say um uh, i come i'm peaceful because i'm doing that little thing that is needed or that little thing that i think i can do when we are talking about outer peace the peace around again we got it uh, as a catechist as a person teaching my ch- um, children and uh 
and their parents. I was really focused um, uh, on just helping parents to bring up their children. And we would pray and say, well, let us, let us be peace. May peace be on earth. And at the same time, my question was always, what am I doing for that peace? Um, so it is not granted just coming from God. It is because we are building that peace. Um, I want peace at home. If parents come back from home and are, are shouting and and uh, forcing and uh, things at home and speaking disrespectfully to their children, my God, you can pray for peace, but it is difficult to achieve it. If you talk about companions, I want my child to be peaceful. And then when he speaks or she, she speaks about companions, I criticize the companion, the parent, the teacher, the, the person that is working at home can that child be peaceful? So I think that both in inner peace and outer peace, there should be a commitment, a grounding. And uh, in Spanish, we say something like, adiós rogando y con el mazo dando. That means that you pray for something, but you do at the same time. So if we want peace, let us commit with peace. And this is perhaps I'm not going to reach uh, the presidents uh, in Ukraine uh, in the world that are kind of putting us in the verge of, of a, a war. But I can make peace at home. I can help that the environment where I work is peaceful. And uh, if I really bridge and cooperate. So that's my two cents. Thank you. Thank you. That's wonderful. Like this, uh, we have to be peaceful uh, with inner peace. And also we have to make peace at home. And Father Presa, what do you think about peace? And what does peace mean to you? Uh, Father, you are muted, please. So, ah, okay, thank you, thank you. So I will say uh, what Dr. Abraham and uh, Maria shared uh, is just uh, the basic uh, uh, concepts and points and uh, uh, the same thing I will put in different, in different words. So I, am, I belong to the Carmelite order, a contemplative order uh, and living the Carmelite spirituality of St. Therese of Havila, St. John of the Cross, and St. Therese of Lisieux, and Edistine, etc. Uh, so uh, for me, uh, peace is the atmosphere or the environment of the heart. So we also speak about eco spirituality, you know? So when we speak about ecology, we talk about the nature around us. But we are a microcosm cosm, and we have our inter, inner environment. And uh, as uh, Abraham was telling, you know, this inner uh, is polluted. Then actually, then we will not have peace. And we know a restless person will do anything. And uh, from our spiritual uh, tradition, the Carmelite order, we give a lot of importance for inner silence. Suppose if Putin and Biden extra stop talking, things will be better. <laughs> of course, if they talk positively, also things will be better. But you know, always uh, talking with the connotations and you know, all the connotations of power, threat, dominion, etc. No, uh, dominance, uh, etc. So uh, it affects the whole world. Uh, even uh, the young, young, young people, you know, sometimes. Uh, I feel today in our philosophy classes, uh, some students were asking in the seminary, uh, they are allowed very less uh, hours for internet. So they were asking me, uh, how far is the um, Russian uh, uh, attack on Ukraine? So they watch it something like a video game. No, They feel uh, like an action film. So if some bombing is going, it's wonderful. Uh, the, so the, uh, the mentality, uh, 
uh, or the mind, or the, uh, the attitude of the heart. For me, uh, that is the most important thing. Uh, so I would like to repeat the great Archbishop, the American Archbishop Fulton J. Sheen, who said, there can be no world peace unless there is soul peace. Uh, so the peace in our heart. And uh, how we can achieve it? It's very beginning. It's like this. Caption, man. Caption is an auto So uh, the way to achieve, uh, I can also say, share it only from our perspective or means the, uh, the spiritual perspective of, of our order. As I told you, or as, as I mentioned, silence. Uh, silent our silence our heart silence our mind then let us not stop then try to contemplate try to contemplate the creator the beauty of this nature the beauty of the plants around the beauty of the animals the beauty of the insects you know i live in kochi um, and we have a lot of mosquitoes here sometimes i feel uh, <laughs> A little bit sad to kill these mosquitoes when they try to steal my blood but sometimes i kill them but you know with a little pain uh, because I, I i i think you know i can't create a mosquito uh, of course the robotic mechanics engineers will, will be able to uh, they are creating such things but so little an insect has a life um, uh, so uh, from a peaceful heart towards an empathetic uh, attitude, empathy. That's also Edistein, our great saint, who was um, murdered in the Second World War. She speaks about empathy. Um, so uh, going just uh, beyond sympathy and compassion and uh, feeling with the other, experience the pain of the other. Means uh, trying to experience even the pain of the other uh, uh, other lives. See, for example, in India, in Jainism, we have this beautiful tradition of not killing uh, uh, intentionally even the bacteria. You know? So the Jainists, they have uh, every year some 40 days of fasting uh, as a penance because usually when we breathe, we breathe in a lot of bacteria and we kill them. So as a penance, they stop cooking and uh, they uh, uh, repent over it. So uh, from a peaceful heart to a loving heart, uh, there is also another uh, uh, quotation from St. John of the Cross. St. John of the Cross uh, says, who is a saint, a mystic of our order, he says, um, where there is no love, put love and you will find love. Uh, so I uh, also remember the words of the Swiss theologian Hans von Balthasar, who said, even if a unity of faith is not possible, a unity of love is possible. So we are living in a multi-religious, multi, uh, multi-linguistic um, culture and country. Uh, a unity of faith may not be possible, but unity of, of love, even with an atheist, even with a person of a totally different mentality, love is possible. And because we have, God has given us this capacity to love. We know that even Hitler had a girlfriend. So this love is in everyone. And when we purify it, um, and when we make our heart peaceful, then peace begins in our heart. And I'm so happy. I know that all of you are this messengers of peace. I'm so happy to be in your presence and to be with you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Father. And it's uh, like talking about ego spirituality reminds me about one of the Holy Book Conference on Holy Books and Eco Spirituality, where we shared about the beauty of nature and finding the commonness in the faith. So thank you. Thank you, Father, for sharing the beauty of environment and beauty of inner soul. And moving to Sylvia, what peace means to you and why is it so important to bring peace? Yeah, thank you, Krashma. And I just echo the gratitude and awe of all things Eco Peace Teen Cafe. So thank you for having me. And it's an honor to join everyone on this panel. 
Um, so peace building means so many things to me. I'm not really sure where to start on that. So I'll start from the second part of the question and hopefully through that response, the my answer for the first part will emerge. Um, but the question of why it is so important to build peace in the current era reminds me of a quote from the late John O'Donohue and that says most Fundamentalism, greed, violence, oppression can be traced back to the separation of idea and affection. And that separation that we're so deeply experiencing right now makes it critical and essential to be building peace, to have bonds that spark compassion and tenderness, connections that infuse and bridge our perceptions, ideas, and ways of thinking with affection. And when we're equipped with that inspiration and awareness, those connections, we can become more present to each other um, to approach conflict with a new lens, you know, a lens of acknowledgement, of curiosity, of courage and connection, rather than letting it spin and spiral into violence in all of its forms. And we're in a moment, I think that is so powerfully calling for acknowledgement of and action on our individual and collective responsibility to one another, our boundedness, our interconnectedness and practicing peace in this moment, it, to me is having empathy to connect with the so-called other, however that shows up in your life, however that's defined for you in your life, whoever that is. And as the like pioneer of peace leadership, Whitney McIntyre Miller says, to discover the other in and as oneself is critical in order to embrace our common humanity. And I think that's the transformation of relationship and of peace building we need now in every space that we're in. It's human connection that is deep, that is spiritual, that is real. And that is the heart of what makes my life, everybody's life whole, meaningful, ethereal, and it's crucial for laying the groundwork for peace. And um, I think it's also really important for me to acknowledge that in peace building, it's not some separate sector uh, of work and of being. Peace building truly to me is an everyday act and a practice done by everyday individuals, no matter your field, if you're in health or government or the economy, architecture, transportation, media, education, business, climate change, environmental sustainability, whatever it is that you are doing and whatever your passion is that you're involved in, peace building and conflict sensitivity applies and is relevant. And we can all be leading peace in, as Maria said, in our own selves, in our lives, in our relationships, our communities, and that will impact and transform systems and structures globally. That's what it means to me. Thank you. Thanks, Sylvia, like for sharing that peace building is uh, like, it really matters to everyone, not just uh, someone focusing on peace building career, but it's always like, even if we are in different career or different job, peace building is essential and it's our part of daily life. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sylvia. And, and now I would like to um, ask Dr. Abraham Perikim about the global campaign on 1 billion youth for peace. So can you please share the story behind 1 billion youth for peace and what motivates you to start this global campaign? And I know like peace process is not easy and simple. It needs patience, compassion and strong determination. So this is the moment for next 10 years. So uh, like, please share the story. We are so eager to hear. Uh, yeah, thank you, Reshma. Uh, I want. I would like to thank all the panelists also for their wonderful insights. <clears throat> um, yeah, this will help us go a long way in creating a culture of peace. Uh, so we have been getting uh, great insights from all our panelists. So 1 billion youth for bees, whether it is in 10 years, 20 years, 100 years, we don't know. But we want to reach all the children. All the children have to become peace ambassadors in this world. That is our ultimate goal. It is a big dream. So uh, it's exactly what uh, where we all you know, concluded here because uh, peace is possible. 
Maria said, this is possible, and uh, all of us agree. But where to begin, how to begin, uh, how we can carry it into, uh, into different parts of the world. Because uh, children are the leaders of today. They can lead us even today. Not They are not the leaders of tomorrow. So it is with, the, with, with this intention that we started this campaign, One Billion Peace, uh, Youth for Peace. I would like to show you a short video so that you can understand what we are doing and then uh, what our intention is. So it will be clear. Uh, can I share the screen, Reshma? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, Ibrahim, it is not sharing if that is what you wanted to do. Sir, we can't see the screen. But... No, sir, uh, just the voice. Ah, uh, yes, yes, now we can see. Uh, uh, sir, we are just seeing the home screen, uh, not the video. Maybe you can click in the uh, at the bottom. We can't see that. Abraham, if you want, you can send it to me, and uh, and while you are talking, I put it. Uh, please send it to us so we can share it. Yes, okay. Uh, I don't know what happened. Maybe, uh, but you can hear me. Uh, yeah, no. Yeah. But we can hear the music, so oh. please. Uh, Also, but it was not the music also we could see but uh, not further moving I'm so sorry. I don't know what happens. <laughs> maybe, yeah. Maybe I'll uh, share it with you later. Anyway, this is a campaign, and we go to all the schools and uh, 
2,000 children in one school and uh, 2,500, maybe 500. So we <clears throat> help them take a peace pledge and uh, they are supposed to become peace ambassadors. And then we have the follow-up programs in the schools. And so we want to reach as many youngsters as possible. We have now a lot of videos prepared by the voices for, for a world free of nuclear weapons. And uh, we educate them. <clears throat> we have different resource materials for all ages, you know, of children. So yeah, the, this is the program and we consider children uh, very important because they have to be educated so that we create a peaceful world for, yeah, for the future. Thank you. Sorry for this. Um, thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you for sharing about. Uh, and Tanya shared one uh, video on the chat. So Arya, can you please uh, share that? I hope that's the video. About FOP, uh, no, about one billion youth for peace. Uh, Adia, maybe if in between we can move to Sylvia. So Sylvia, uh, I also participated in the peace practice, Ali. So I really want to hear. Um, do do you think peace practice, peace practice, Ali, really transform the peace builders? And uh, can you please explain how it influenced the life of peace builders? Yeah, thank you, Krishma. Well, as an alumna of the program, I think you can answer this question actually better than I can, but I'll give it a go. Um, first, to just give some very general context of what the Peace Practice Alliance program is. It's a six-month peace leadership program that Euphrates runs for peace leaders worldwide. And we move through personal, interpersonal, community, global peace theory and practices and how we hold all of those together in peace leadership in our lives and work. So it's a global community of leaders. We come together to invest our time and energy and practice in this space. And at the moment we have 30 leaders from 17 countries and we have an alumni community of 78 leaders in 40 countries. So that's just a kind of overview just to understand what the Peace Practice Alliance is and when I'm talking about the impact and transformation and influence of it. Um, I trust it's sparking transformation for others as every day I can feel it transforming myself. Um, I mean, there are people even on this call like Greshma, you organizing this, and there are others from the PPA community on this call, and that feels like a testament to that reciprocal support and curiosity that is present. And transformation is so personal and so subjective it happens on its own you know transformation can happen in one conversation it can happen over the course of six months it can happen years after someone finishes the program and sudden sudden something clicks you know um and that so i can't speak certainty to transformation happening in peace leaders only they can describe that for themselves only you can describe that for yourself though i certainly trust that it is happening and i can share about what we've what we've heard through program evaluations interviews and multiple layers of feedback from participants about the influence on their lives um, peace leaders have shared about having a deeper knowledge and awareness on peace leadership theory and practice on skills and that applies both in their understanding and also confidence in its application in the world. And that's increased confidence in one's capacity to maintain a sense of peace within themselves and their communication with others and in leading community peace building efforts. Um, peace leaders have shared a lot about their work having more of like a framework and a grounding. So their work prior being described as scattered or moving through it, but without really having like a firm purpose in it. And now it's being more organized and more honed, feeling like they can really now share their work with others, be it friends or family members, community members or funders, and really share why this work is so important in their context and in the global context. Peace leaders have also shared about being more mindful, more patient, more attentive to their own needs and those present in community. 
of, I've heard a lot about like a deep shift in tending to one's own personal peace practice, really prioritizing it, honoring it, recognizing that self-care is not selfish, but essential. Um, participants have felt a sense of like real self-discovery and sometimes even like self-healing through materials and also the community support that's present. Peace leaders in the program have also shared about feeling competent, confident and capable to have a difficult conversation, um, to have their voice heard, to practice empathy in conversation with others and to just really truly deeply listen to others, have feeling about able and ready to initiate a project um, and to lead work in their community, moving from the background of the work to the leadership of the work, which is exciting, to being even more analytical and attentive to detail in a project. And mostly what I've so often heard is that peace leaders have shared about the deep connectedness of being in a global community um, and what that's opened up for them. You know, lifelong learning from experiences in other countries and contexts and feeling courageous and feeling held in a global community, feeling a newfound sense of interconnectedness, um, you know, having a global community that you're part of and just knowing that you're, you're in that you're not alone. Um, it's a deep inspiration to see how brave and courageous other peace leaders in the world are coming from so many different contexts and cultures. And, you know, the power of like knowing that I'm sitting here in the United States and there's Someone I know in Palestine, in Liberia, in Bangladesh, in India, in Cameroon, in Vietnam, and all working towards peace. And it's not just something that I'm just sitting in my own room and space and just trust it's happening and have hope in the world that goodness is going on, but actually meeting and knowing and connecting with peace leaders and learning about them personally and professionally, that's profound connection. And so I think with all of that, the influence of the program in lives is multifold. It's personal to the individual and to the point in their life in which they're entering the program, how they show up in the program, what they open up to in the program. I think it's really precious and beautiful to witness all the possibilities that are present. You know, there could be someone with immense experience in peace building that's finding growth in community or new eyes in their practice, or there's someone really new to peace practice, who's finding confidence and skills to really own and lead their own work. And so it's really personal, but I trust that it's happening and we're, we're here for all of it. Thanks, Sylvia, for sharing that. And Echo Peace Teen Cafe uh, started because of your you pretty seems dude, and you made me believe that we can create a family through online. So that's what happened in uh, PPA. And also, it gives me a feeling of that I'm not alone in my journey. There are like loads of peace builders who are there to uh, to be like to guide me and like to show the way. So thank you so much for organizing a course like PPA for the people out there, for the peace builders. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sylvia, for that sharing. And we know United Religions Initiative is a grassroots organization, and it's uh, already in its uh, 22 years of anniversary. So I would like to listen how, what are the impacts of URI in peace building and how it um, give motivation to the peace builders at the grassroots level. Maria. Thank you, Grashma. And, uh, and URI is 20 years old and URI is a community. Uh, URI is a network of um, cooperation circles doing amazing work, such as the one that Abraham was talking in South India or Ifratis is doing in US. Um, what, when you talk about impact, um, Reshma, or you ask the, the question, specifically what Abraham and Sylvia were saying is, there was this belief that it was very difficult to understand the, imp the impact of what organizations such as URI or doing transformational work uh, could be measured. And uh, so I really, uh, agree with what um, Sylvia was saying about it is subjective. It is difficult to measure the transformation. It is not in a certain time. It happens at different times, different moments. How to measure that, how to understand that impact and why this is important for URI 
now uh, undergoing an impact assessment of the network. Um, it is important because we need to know what we are doing well and what we could do better. And if at URI we say the purpose of United Religious Initiative is ending religiously motivated violence, creating cultures of peace, justice, and healing. Are we doing what we say we are doing? Uh, that is a good question. And how are we doing that? And what are the good things that we are doing to achieve that? And what are the things that we need to change? Because of course, when URI was, charter was signed in 2000, for instance, the creation of the preamble purpose and principles was fax. So we sent faxes uh, from Argentina to India and to US and we changed a single world word and then the, all the charter changed and then again a, a next round of draft version and then until we got to this PPPs that we call that guide our communities and now we are meeting on zoom and uh, we are in different parts of the world and we are together so the world has changed uh, how we adapt there's a principle in URI that says uh, we are uh, that is called principle 19 that says we are committed to organizational learning and adaptation. And so to be able to adapt, we have to measure. And that's why we are undergoing this impact assessment and uh, trying to design the indicators. So the transformation that Sylvia was talking about, how do we measure the, the level of empathy? How, how did this grow? How, how people are more confident and uh, it is difficult to, to understand. Uh, that's ma marvelous that there are um, professionals that have developed uh, different ways of measuring this internal transformation or this community transformations. And we are in the middle of, of this project now. So we, I cannot say this is the impact that URI is bringing to the world, but uh, again, I, I try to think in a different way because as a Christian, uh, perhaps I thought, well, I don't need to know the results. I have to do my best to do what I think it is important to do. And I don't need anyone to praise me of what I'm doing to continue my work. Um, I have to be humble. And at the same time, um, this is true, of course, we, there's so much to do that's not time for um, clapping. And uh, it is time to, to do what is needed to be done. But at the same time, it is important that we know uh, how the impact of what we are doing. And uh, in the case of URI, we are trying to understand the network. Uh, I was so happy to hear from you, Krishma, that um, the PPA gave you the, this spirit of belonging because URI is about that, how much is true that we say that it is a local work. So cooperation circles do local work globally connected and how much we feel that we are really globally connected. And I think that as a, as a believer, I think God has gave, given us the possibilities to be here at this moment. So when you or I was created, the network was yeah, people in different parts. And I knew that Abraham was in India, but I could not connect with him apart from spirituality, perhaps an email, but that we are here today and that we learn of what we are doing and that we can gather in prayer, in inspiration, in, uh, yeah. And the effort to understand if what we are doing is really doing what we say it's doing. So. Let us continue this work together. Uh, building cooperation is what URI is doing. Uh, and it is not easy because the world is not that prone to cooperation, collaboration. Uh, but here we are helping each other. Thank you. Thanks, Maria. That's so wonderful. And I joined URI when I was 14 years old. So. From there, like you are, I changed my perspective on how I see the world and how I see other religion. And, and I started learning about others' uh, faith and their faith practices. So it really 
transformed my life and uh, taking peace building as a career like and working for my passion so that's really a kind of transformation for me personally and i know like um, that's how it really impacted the uh, the world world of 100 countries that uri is um, in like in the presence of uri as corporation sector so thank you so much for sharing that so now arya is ready to share her screen so we can uh, watch uh, watch the video and then we will move to father prasad
Um, thanks, Tanya and Arya for sharing that. Uh, do you like to share? No, it's okay. Thank you for showing that. So you have uh, seen how we go to various schools in different states and you know, we want to expand it, you know. I'm seeking the support of all our, our coordinators and URI friends and other friends and see if we all join hands together, we can uh, spread this message. We would like to go from campuses to campuses and enroll children as peace ambassadors. That is our ultimate goal. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And Father Prasad. So, uh, Father Prasad is a Carmelite monk. So, we would like to hear how Carmelite community build peace and the process of building peace in the community. So, Father Prasad. So can you hear me? Oh, yes. yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Geshma. Um, so compared to the works, uh, the ministry done by everyone present here, I am say the field of peace, I'm doing very little. <laughs> um, when I was watching this video, uh, Hansar, etc. Great things. All of you are doing so. I also heard uh, from Geshma what she's doing it's wonderful so i will share the little things which uh, i have been doing or uh, continue to do now as a carmelite monk uh, so in my now i am 25 years priesthood as a catholic priest so, so in these 13 years i was in europe for my studies in italy germany and switzerland so i have seen you know um, uh, a lot of, uh, uh, not violence, but you know, not the direct open violence. Uh, so now Europe has also become a multicultural, multi-religious uh, society. So uh, even in the university, I could see uh, uh, that people are mentally disturbed. That means uh, the presence of uh, foreigners, uh, migrants, etc. Uh, etc. Et so a lot of uh, you can hear from here and there. Uh, then I thought, you know, uh, we have to do something in this situation uh, so that people can live in love. Uh, so after my studies in Germany, uh, uh, my order asked me to move to Switzerland to do something based on my studies because I did my studies on the German philosopher called Nicolas Sokusa. And uh, I was also concentrating on the concept of dialogue, the different elements of dialogue. So then uh, with the collaboration of the Diocese of Basel, we could found a, a intercultural and a religious dialogue center in the city of Basel. And the speciality of that center was, it was 24 hours open day and night uh, for everyone. Suppose people wanted to want prayer, they can come there. Suppose if they want to eat, they can come there. If they want to talk, they want the counseling, uh, day and night they could come. Uh, so I was four years there. And uh, it was, you know, in the city of Basel is very much international and also very open city. There are more than 100 religious groups there uh, in the city. Uh, so, the must, uh, my, my, my first uh, experience of interreligious dialogue, etc., was in the city of Basel, that is uh, between uh, uh, Christians, Muslims, and Jews. Uh, it was wonderful. Uh, so, I had a lot of friends there, and uh, I understood actually uh, this uh, love of neighbor starts. Uh, with friendship first. And I understood unity can be built up only through friendship. Suppose if Biden and Putin are good friends, nothing will happen in this world. Um, so friendship uh, is, so I could become friends uh, with, uh, for example, in the city of Basel, there are 13 mosques. So we also used to conduct the football games between imams and Catholic priests um, and the youth, Catholic youth, 
uh, come to the church uh, and uh, we go to the mosque so a lot of uh, open dialogue uh, it was one of wonderful experience then you know uh, switzerland is more a protestant uh, uh, dominant uh, country catholics are minority there so there was also uh, protestant and evangelical groups uh, with whom also i could engage in ecumenical dialogue Actually, I would say my contribution was not much. It was for me a training period, just a tra training period. Uh, so then when I came back to India, uh, so Father Robi is here, Father Robi CMI. Uh, he's my predecessor. And I would say Father Robi has done wonderful things here in Kerala in the field of interreligious dialogue and ecumenism. And now Father is going to nationalize it. Now he's in Delhi. Or whatever he has gathered and he has done here. So I am his successor. Um, and the last two, uh, two years, because of this corona, etc., we couldn't do much. But the effort, uh, two main points, especially in Kerala, you know, now the politicization of, uh, uh, sorry, uh, politicization of religion is one of the biggest problem. Now uh, the peacemakers are politicians. Actually, they are not. Uh, uh, seeking for peace, therefore seeking for what banks. Uh, uh, so they create a kind of uh, artificial peace in their own favor, not for the good of the society. That is one of the uh, big problem here. And we have a lot of polarization. And what we try through the uh, bishops conference uh, is this, that every diocese has a, a priest in charge of uh, dialogue and ecumenism. And then these directors are supposed to uh, uh, conduct themselves with people through the parish priest. Uh, so that networking, that means from the bishop conference through the, to these directors, from the directors to people. Uh, but uh, the biggest problem is, it's very difficult to find committed people. Uh, most of them take this as a uh, side business, not as the, as the main ministry. So uh, how this is growing now because of the uh, conscientization and because of the awareness that we have to do something, otherwise things will not go ahead well. So people are slowly becoming uh, aware and uh, growing in their ministry. Uh, another uh, thing is uh, the network. I think the better network is done by Abraham Saar uh, in the schools that we have our own schools uh, at present. Uh, most of the concentration is in our own schools because the future, usually it's the future, say Abraham Sass uh, selling today, they are the leaders, no? Uh, so uh, we aim at always, that was the, so it was a beautiful to hear from Abraham Sass, the children are the leaders of today. So we always say they are leaders of the future. So conscientizing the children, uh, especially uh, this concept, unity of love, Unity of faith, we know, um, uh, the children have to grow up, and then, then they will realize what is essential and what unites us. But now uh, the unity of love, that is through little, little uh, activities in the schools. Uh, you know, the, almost all the schools have a lot of activities, they do it, but you know, in a little bit more awareness about this oneness. Uh, of the human race, the oneness that the other uh, is my brother, other is my neighbor. Uh, such small, small works are going on. Uh, and uh, last thing, uh, one of the wishes and one of the effort which is at present going on is to build up a state level forum of religious leaders, all the religious leaders, uh, because there are certain issues now and then then as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, politicians talk about religion. Politicians uh, have the upper hand as peacemakers. Uh, religious leaders are silent. So whenever there is a conflict or a situation where uh, there are sensitive issues uh, connected to religion, religious leaders are not coming out. They are silent. So the Bishop's Conference is now trying to gather different religious leaders in a state level, a forum, an association, uh, uh, so that we can sit together and talk about the issues. Not uh, we leave things to the government or self-interested 
uh, groups. Yeah, these are the uh, little things which are going on here in Kerala, in the south part of India. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Father, for sharing your work with us. And it's so important, like, as we all are living in Kerala, we know, like, what is right, happening right now. So it's very important to make aware and do work for that. So you also mentioned about the mental disturbance uh, faced by students in European countries. So I would like to ask Sylvia about the personal peace practice and why is it so important to do the personal peace practice and how does Euphrates seems to support the peace builders around the world during the crisis? I know like Euphrates Institute are doing lots of things for the peace builders. So. But especially, I like to know how you help the peace builders during the crisis time. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Krishna. Um, try to answer as best as I can. So, personal peace practice. Um, as Maria, you were saying earlier, it's so important because it's just it's our base, our love, nourishment, and care for ourselves is essential how we tend to ourselves influences how we show up in the world. So personal peace practice is a very deep personal, personal connection to individual selves, our being, our souls, and being in touch with that shapes how we show up. And there's so much right now in the ether on self-care and taking care of oneself. And I think personal peace practice is those things and it's more, it's beyond self-care, it's self-knowing, self-awareness, love, tending, healing, trusting, responsibility, and it's really creating a home within ourselves that we can always come back to. It's our base to do the work within us so we can show up in the space between us and then work and lead to the bounty and beauty that is possible beyond us. And I think personal peace practice also gives us the space to continuously tend to our own inner readiness for peace work. You know, we learn so much about phenomenal leaders and ancestors in peace work who have come before us. And at the foundation of their greatness that we learn about and that we celebrate, lies this inner courage, awareness, compassion, understanding, and care. And we need to be present to be ready for the work. And I think that's um, just a sliver of why personal peace practice is so important. We could talk for so long about why it's so essential. Um, but within that, going to the second part of that question, Euphrates supports peace leaders around the world in various ways during particularly challenging times. And the most like simple way, quote unquote, we offer space, space to, and that's a complex thing, space to be oneself, to show up however you are, to ground in your body, to connect with others in a heart uh, centered environment, and just to simply be who you are in a moment. And we listen, connect and encourage, we stand with folks in solidarity and uplift their work. And so much of our work is relationship. So that's what we do in times, uh, in challenging times. It's we honor that relationship and that worthiness and support them. So what that actually looks like and means is asking them with, what do peace leaders need? What do they want? And then doing everything we can to make that happen. That can be offering a listening ear, checking in on WhatsApp or Signal continuously, sending financial support for a project, mobilizing resources to get someone to physical safety and then tending to their mental and emotional and spiritual well-being from that point forward, um, finding opportunities to advance someone and their skills. It could be making introductions to organizations and individuals who can better support that person, um, making connections for fruitful collaborations, and even just ensuring that one's basic needs are met. And so then they can be secure and know that they have security and stability to then be able to do the work that they continue to do and love. And so the ways of support and being in solidarity are truly endless. And we do that both through our programs and also just as our way of operating, I would say. And in thinking about 
you know, the importance of personal peace and also how Euphrates supports peace leaders in the world in challenging times. Uh, two quotes come to mind that I always hold really dear and inspiring to me. One is from Reverend Angel Kyoto Williams that says, without inner change, there can be no outer change and without collective change, no change matters. And another quote that has become very popular from Nikita Valerio is shouting self-care at people who actually need community care is how we fail people. And these two quotes touch on really different things, but they both in their own way relate to how our inner peace or inner change or inner readiness influences the outer and how collective community care is essential. So while personal peace practice is as the name implies, it's inherently personal, the power and transformation of it comes from practicing it deeply and wholly in community. And then from that place of personal peace that develop structures in community and relationship that enable us to give and contribute um, to others while balancing our own needs. And as Nikita Valerio also says, it's Community care, it's about trusting that your community will have you when you need support and knowing you can be trusted to provide the same. And that is what I think Euphrates works to build. That's what Euphrates does in challenging times for peace leaders is we work to build that trust and provide it for them in challenging times and support them individually and in community on personal peace practice and care in, in crisis and in challenge. Thanks, Sylvia, for sharing um, how important uh, the personal peace practice is and how we can do that. So thank you so much for sharing that. And when we talk about crisis, we know like uh, we all suffered due to a COVID-19 crisis. So I would like to know how, how does URI overcome the challenges of COVID-19? Maria, can you please share? Thank you, Gureshma. And... Uh... to peace and sometimes we think of peace as uh, against war or the lack of war and um, we know that there are conflict drivers and uh, there are many uh, that are impacting our world uh, poverty human rights uh, and in this case health in the lack of health and the disparity in the uh, in the possibilities, the health possibilities is something that is a conflict driver. So I'm so thrilled that you are asking that question in the midst of a peace building uh, or a, a, a conference that's referring to peace. And uh, we know that religious people, religious communities um, stand up uh, very clearly um, to respond to this conflict drivers. So we do have Caritas in the Catholic Church and we have Sedaka in the in the Jewish community and uh, we had the Sakat um, in, in the Muslim community and each of the Hindu, every community wants to provide support in times of crisis uh, and wants to address these conflict drivers. Um, URI is an interfaith organization. Uh, where people of different faiths get together to, with a common purpose. And in getting together with a common purpose, they, they build this relationship that you were talking about. So yes, there's a, a relationship building that happens through the cooperation circles. And at the same time, this gives us the possibility to address the needs of the community in a collaborative way. And so, I don't know, the fires at this moment we have in a province of Argentina, Corrientes, um, a fire. How, how are we doing, how religious communities that are already mm. stepping up to help those in need, if we do it together, it is more impactful, talking about impact. And so what is URI doing in terms of COVID is trying to reach out to those in need together in religious diversity. And there is a page in the website that speaks about the very different uh, actions that cooperation circles around the world took 
and of course, again, um, URI is a network. So URI is not doing directly the action, but it is creating the network and the inspiration and the context so that people, cooperation circles addressing COVID feel supported. And I have read beautiful stories about cooperation circles around the world doing amazing things at this time uh, of support, of providing hy hygiene. Um, I think of Global Compassion CC, uh, providing water in the midst of a, a, a very kind of a place where there's no water so that people can drink water and be safe and also wash their hands, etc. cetera. Um, education, there's so much um, need for education. So um, in times of COVID, um, uh, these and many, and, and the spiritual, uh, Sylvia was talking about um, mental health. The fact that we are together in Zooms all the time and we are not isolated. So one of the pains that COVID has been be alone uh, and usually old, older people have felt that the loneliness of not being able to go to the streets and, and meet other people and uh, URI cooperation circles have provided spaces um, to for people to get together for uh, yeah bringing medicine bringing and uh, and water and hygiene and education in times of crisis and uh, again I really believe in interfaith cooperation and uh, in, whether it is COVID or other conflict driver let us be together and uh, we can provide solutions to our community in our church but we are all brothers and sisters so the more that we work together and that the more that we provide help together without uh, thinking of a certain community open to the larger community this is wonderful and just to end i I bring this up, a cooperation circle in Kenya that is Blood Life um, Kenya. And it is, they, they say that the blood that we have in our veins um, is red in every, around the world and each and every person. So it's not the Muslim blood and the Christian blood and or the Hindu blood. It is just providing blood because um, this is something that is helpful. So. Uh, yeah, we are all together in this and solution is not individual or in a closed community. The solution is also working together for the good of all. Thanks, Maria, for sharing the importance of uh, working together and sharing uh, during the crisis time. So I would like to ask Dr. Abraham, uh, that how can we build sense of unity and culture of culture of appreciating the diversity among any people. As we heard about the uh, stories of Kenya, about uh, how the URI Corporation Circle working for unity. So how can we build this sense of unity among any people? Uh, yeah, we, we are not alone as many, many of our speakers said. We have alternate views. There is no reason for any disappointment because the, the world is evolving. So evolution should be towards God's kingdom, ultimate peace. So we have hundreds of organizations working towards peace and, uh, and a great involvement of youth in that. So even uh, during this uh, pandemic period, we find it as an opportunity, you know, it should not be. So there is a saying in English, like uh, pessimist finds difficulties in opportunities, whereas optimist finds opportunities in difficulties. This is exactly what I have seen the, the youth have been doing even during this pandemic period. Uh, as Maria said. So they come forward and uh, uh, we can join hands with all the peacemaking organizations, peace building organizations. Because I always say peace, we have to build peace in peace or during peace. 
when there is a war, we cannot go and build peace there. So when we have a peaceful atmosphere, peace building is possible. That is where we have to plant this kind of uh, feeling in the minds of the youngsters. And for that, even the pandemic period is it's fine. You know, even during this pandemic period, we could uh, uh, help 1,000 families with flood relief, livelihood activities, you know, and the youngsters gave us wonderful support for that, you know. So um, the, we conducted uh, the intercontinental interfaith peace competition just to familiarize the youngsters with the holy books. So the best way to understand the other religion, understand the other scriptures, to, to do away with the fear of the other. So we have to draw them to the resources, the beautiful resources of the religious books. I always say all the religious books are like uh, uh, chapters of one holy book. We have only one holy book and all the religious scriptures are like the chapters of the one holy book. This kind of an idea has to be implanted in the minds of the young people. You know, uh, so we have we can do a lot, uh, and a pandemic or no pandemic, we have to uh, support the evolutionary process, and we have to evolve towards the God's kingdom, the ultimate peaceful world. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, sir, for sharing uh, that. And uh, yeah, like whenever we host interfaith dialogues, there, uh, I had like from a critical point that there are like-minded people are coming together and having dialogues. So my question is, how can we reach the unreachable, that those who are not willing to participate in the interfaith dialogue, how can we reach them? So I would like to ask this to Father Prasad. So what's your opinion on how can we reach them? and? include them. Father, you are muted, please. Yeah, now we are. Okay. <clears throat> so whenever we uh, speak about dialogue, uh, very often uh, we think about people who have who have knowledge about religion or like us who are working in the area of peace. But we know the vast majority is just away from all this. Uh, therefore, uh, uh, Catholic Church also speaks about uh, dialogue of life. Uh, dialogue of life, uh, that means uh, people of different cultures, different religion, living in neighborhood and participating in the uh, uh, joys and sorrows of each one and celebrating life. So every religion also gives occasions to celebrate life. So celebrate the festival, celebrate. So I think uh, even here, uh, this, this custom was automatic or traditionally existing in Kerala, etc. Everyone celebrated on everyone celebrated Christmas. Everyone used to hang uh, stars for Christmas, but it is slowly disappearing. Autumn, the autumn is slowly becoming a Hindu festival. Christmas is slowly becoming a Christian festival. Uh, so for example, uh, I'm living in Aliwa. Here, most of our neighbors, uh, some 90% of neighbors are Muslims and 10% of Hindus. And here, uh, since few years in the shops, during Christmas, we don't see uh, any star. But I, I was a student here in our philosophy college in 1988-92. Uh, Those days I could see stars in every shop. Uh, so that means this, uh, a, there is this lack in the dialogue of life is affecting. I mean, that is the most important friendship between the neighbors, helping each other, visiting, uh, anchoring about their welfare. So dialogue of life is the solution because we can't call uh, uh, the ordinary people for a dialogue, a doctrinal dialogue, or about an international global issue, or uh, for a theme which, which needs a good preparation. So my proposal uh, is this dialogue of life. 
Thanks, Father, for sharing that uh, dialogue of life. So it's so uh, so wonderful to hear that. And yeah, we planned our session from seven to eight thirty. So we already at eight thirty now. So I'm just asking one more question to you all. So this is like how international organization or religious institutions can support young people. How can we support our young people? And also, you would like uh, you can share about your vision or dream for the next uh, next ten years. Yes. Um, Maybe Sylvia get that. <laughs> just asking, just asking the big questions, Kreshma. No, no big <laughs> deal. <laughs> um, well, we could support youth probably by having them answer this question. Um, I know I'm probably technically defined as youth by some standards, but I think there are many others on this call and elsewhere at whom from whom I'd love to hear their answers on this. Um, but I, I think we all know this, that I think or, international organizations, any organization can support young people by deeply listening to them and following their lead, um, recognizing their agency, their leadership, their stories, their lived experiences, their immense capacity for to lead conflict transformation work and to challenge everyday perspectives. Um, you know, the Peace Practice Alliance emerged essentially from deep listening. There's a difference between really hearing someone and listening to someone. And there's such power in meeting needs when we take the time to really listen and understand what those needs are. And I've witnessed youth around the world listen and speak from the heart, relentlessly fight for what they believe in, uh, really dive head first into uncertainty and vulnerability, sit with their fears, embrace conflict as opportunity for growth and uplift and really live their values every day. And so we know it's possible and we just need to honor that ability and center that in our programming, in our organizational values, in our internal operations, in our funding and financial allocations, like all of it. Um, and I think we can also support youth by really tending to their wellness and what we've been talking about on this call, you know, like true, deep, radical care. Um, and so there's so much to say on that and individual and community care more, but for a peaceful and sustainable world, as you put forth, I think prioritizing and investing heavily in the physical, mental, emotional, and really spiritual health and connection for youth. You know, we could bring people together for workshops and training and learning, but really for that connection and belonging is so important uh, for checking in on each other, holding accountability, recognition of our worthiness and value. And that spiritual connection with another being is so powerful. And I think we can bring youth together in so many ways to experience and to harness that. And I've seen that done to give like one tangible way I've seen that being done and experienced both in person and virtually is through youth coming together through talking circles. So one organization I'm, I know that is doing that is called Saris and based in Southeast Asia. And for over a decade, they've invited youth from conflicting countries to sit in talking circles together, to speak and listen from the heart and to share space and be present with others without judgment to address and transform conflicts. So you invite them to really be themselves, to sit in a circle with strangers who so often you grew up learning negative stereotypes of the other and experiencing and learning the histories of conflict and violence. And when you sit in that circle over time, slowly, steadily, it becomes more comfortable, it becomes more like home. And the people you're sitting with transform from strangers to friends and lovers, community members and chosen family. And, you know, Sarah's recognized and heard this curiosity and need to get to know the other across borders and just provided that container. So I think for youth, that's what we can do is provide space, deeply listen and just invest. And then for your really big question of what's dream and vision for 10 years, my gosh, I honestly, that's, it expands every day. Um, I, so I'll go real top level blue sky here. I think in my core, I feel a like tipping point towards truly 
inclusive systems and structures. So I feel inspired when I think of all the incredible humans I know, and then the incredible humans they know, and that those ripples. So how can we really harness that for a tipping point of leading peace, transforming systems, structures, and policies for peace? You know, there's a lot of complexity and nuance and depth and so much within that, but I think part of my 10-year vision is uh, mobilizing all of that goodness for peace, for all living things. And I'll leave it there with just a ton of gratitude for you, Greshma and Maria, Abraham, and Father Prasad, just for everything shared here today. So thank you. Thank you, Sylvia. That's so beautiful, like how you shared, uh, uh, how can we support young people through international organization and also about your vision. So thank you so much, Sylvia. And um, maybe Maria, do you like to share? Yes, yeah, so I'm glad to follow Sylvia. Um, and uh, and I'm again, thank you for being with Abraham and um, Father Prasad in this discussion and conversation. Um, I think, and I agree with what Abraham said, um, children and youth are the protagonist of today, not tomorrow. They, they are the today. And uh, we need to be very listening, as Sylvia said, and allow them to be in, uh, in the front line, uh, protecting them, giving them a safe space, being close to them, but that their voice is heard. Um, yesterday was in the URI contact list was shared a, a wonderful event from the UN that was the person in charge of uh, violence against children speaking to children. So we cannot keep doing things for children or for youth without having youth and children at the table. It is not what we adults think of what children need. Children have to tell us what they need and we have to be good listeners and respond to their needs. We cannot say youth are leaders and just put them in the photograph because it's nice to have youth in the photograph. No, we have to have them be the speakers, have them be the uh, proactive as you are, Greshma. And I think that the more that we create environments that give a safe space for children and youth uh, be protagonists. That is, and I connect that with my dream. I really dream of a world that listens to the heart of children and youth and is able to give them a voice. Thank you. Thanks, Maria. That's a very, very powerful, actually, like to bring youth on the table, like not just as uh, like participants or viewers, but bring them and give them voice. Thank you so much, uh, Maria, for that. And Father Prasad, please. Uh, you are muted. Yeah, as we uh, discussed already, and I, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, the spiritual impoverishment is the biggest problem today. And I hope in the next 10 years, uh, because of the globalization of the mobile usage and internet, et cetera, uh, children will, and youth will come more and more uh, casually or intentionally to the spiritual, uh, to think of their soul, and they will uh, utilize all the positive opportunities uh, available uh, for building up their own personality, building up their own peace and their own spiritual life. And uh, I hope that this oneness of humanity, that we are all one, uh, they will start because of the help of the science and uh, uh, innovations, all that is going on. Uh, they will think more and more, not globally, cosmically, even they will start to look at I want uh, to our planet from other planets. You no, know? uh, they can think about uh, more about the cosmos, not about our planet. Then they will begin to appreciate uh, the value of life and existence on this planet. All that we have on this planet, uh, how we know how uh, 
difficulty it is even the migration to mars uh, even if elon musk spend all the money we know how risky and how dangerous etc how many lives we lost at least in the beginning decades so uh, our youth will come more and more back to the environment appreciate the environment and we uh, i hope that we all of us uh, together after 10 years can celebrate this beautiful planet and this beautiful life thanks father for uh, sharing that like uh, i hope like after 10 years we can come together and celebrate again celebrate the beauty of him you and went together maybe in person <laughs> so thank you thank you father for that and i would like to hear from dr ibrahim sir please please share your vision and how can yeah, uh, once uh, the melbourne university conducted a survey among the university students to know how much they knew about the other religion and to their surprise you know they found out that only 5% of the university students knew something about the other their classmates who belong to the other religion so that was an eye opener they immediately summoned an international conference how we can take the values the inner faith inner cultural values to the students you know so that resulted in forming interfaith students movements in different universities and campuses like the interfaith youth core in united states led by abu patel and things you know so that is the best thing that we can do bring youth together open up them to the the, the great values of the other religion so that we all understand we are one then the second thing that we can do is to open up i mean all kinds of opportunities facilities you know whenever we have meetings and camps we have to invite youth as stewards or we used to call them blue angels children are like angels so even when the seniors are meeting for conferences we can bring them as stewards just to help in the meeting they learn a lot you know and greshma and isaac and all i told in one of the meetings they came to this movement when they were in 6th standard 8th standard like that so we have to go to the schools meet them in 10 years this is what we intend to do by the, in the 1 billion youth for peace campaign you know so without bringing youth to the real fold of the international organizations you know we cannot help them help build the future so uh, we, there are umpteen things which we can do the traveling peace academy for example we went to different uh, nations and organized young people there gave them training you know and uh, ufra this institute is doing a lot uh, in this line uri is doing a lot in this line you know so the sarvodaya movement the uri counterpart in sri lanka they have activities in almost all the villages of sri lanka we have to go to the interior villages 80% of india are i you know the indian citizens live in villages so we cannot be complacent in being some programs in the cities and in the even in the campuses that is not enough so how to reach out to the the interior uh villages corners of different regions for example africa everywhere we have to go in search of our young people uh, and bring them to the mainstream that is what we, we can do hope to do in the next 10 years thank you thank you sir when you shared about uh, like bringing youth for the conferences and train give training like how to do so uh, like i remember one of the tpa um, held in kerala like uh, i was one of the youngest uh, hey, youngest uh, person who attended the tpa and uh, sir actually gave me instruction and to deal things at the hotel so that was for the first time i'm um, doing some kind of things and i still believe that that's actually created a leader in me and how to deal things and how to uh, lead uh things at, at the age of 17 so i, I use this uh, opportunity to say thank to you for that opportunity that made me who i am today and thank you thank you so much and so 
like i feel so happy today that this is a great session and thank you so much and we have like uh, lots of participants here so before closing i giving one minute for a closing reflection from the participants after that we can close this meeting so if any of you would like to share um, maybe in a minute please raise your hand yes your minute Um, please father please so i have here uh, the peace prayer of saint francis the cc shall i just read it out um is fun lord make me an instrument of your peace where there is hatred let me so love where there is injury pardon where there is doubt faith where there is despair hope where there is darkness light and where there is sadness joy o divine master grant that i may not so much seek to be consoled as to console to be understood as to understand to be loved as to love for it is in giving that we receive it is in pardoning that we are pardoned and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life amen thanks father thanks uh, for the opening of prayer and thank you so much and i'm so grateful to you for uh, to be here so i'm, I'm giving this floor to arya to say thanks and then we can thank you so much uh, it was a great session uh, and i learned a lot uh, because for me peace building is new i have joined the copy simplify and uh, after that only i have heard about peace building uri and all the other uh, chapters and everything so it is a great opportunity to um, for me uh, especially to listen from all of you it was a great discussion and uh, thank you so much uh, for joining us uh, for uh, like taking our invitation seriously and coming and also i extend my uh, gratitude to all the listeners who also joined us uh, from different parts of the world uh, to build peace so let that be peace thank you so much thank you thank you so thank you so much and thank you thanks to all and thanks to yam and uh, the youth group joined us from bhutan thank you so much for staying here for all the meeting and thanks jain sofu thanks morgana and thanks to, thanks to matai kuti sir and thanks to wilson and yeah thanks to upratis team i see you all are here thanks to old holster phil and thank you thank you sushant and everyone and thank you thank you so much to all the panelists you share like great wisdom to us and to carry forever thank you so much be well everybody take care so continue working so much so see you all again <laughs>